Good afternoon, I'm Andy from the Courtyard Dairy and as part of British Cheese Weekend I'm going to be talking about the British Cheese Revival and how we've gone from nothing to the vast array of farmhouse cheese makers we've got now which is fabulous. If I'd have been doing this talk 15 years ago we'd have been talking about some fabulous farmhouse cheeses that are still made today that are absolutely brilliant the likes of Montgomery's Cheddar, Keane's Cheddar and smaller Azan producers like Colston Bassett Stilton but there wasn't many of them. The British cheese industry was on farm was very small and very negligible it was kind of not really existing and um, but in the last 15 years we have seen a resurgence at the courtyard dairy we do about 35 cheeses of which 33 have come about since the year 2000 um, and that's really what I'm going to cover is this resurgence in farmhouse cheese making that's made British cheese industry a bit more vibrant a bit more exciting it all started for me and at the courtyard dairy about 12 years ago um, I was working with my wife Kathy who's behind the behind the phone today in a very posh restaurant, I can smarten up a little bit, believe it or not, in the heart of Edinburgh. And um, we had an amazing cheese board, and there was only one Scottish cheese in there. And at the time, there was barely a couple of Scottish cheese makers making cheese on their farm in Scotland. And so we went to visit that cheese maker, a guy called Humphrey Hamilton, who was a really eccentric little chap making this cheese called Lanark Blue. And he was based um, just outside Edinburgh. And he's making cheese from his own 200 sheep that he was milking by hand, and he made a really interesting cheese that was completely unique to him and a real expression of his farm. And that kind of caught my eye, so we, that kind of got the, 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 the cogs going, and we thought, well, we'd like to learn a little more about this. So I went abroad to France, did a study of cheese maturing in France, then worked in London, then in Bath, and then about seven years ago, my wife and I decided to return back north. Um, she wants to start family or something, some minor detail, and we set up the Courtyard Dairy. And that was with a remit, really, to be part of championing farm-made British cheese. And we're really proud to be part of that resurgence, and that's really what I'm going to cover today. And one of the interesting things about the Dales where we are here, we're right on the edge of the Yorkshire Dales, is once upon a time there was 2,000 farmhouse producers. And one of the things I love about farmhouse cheese is every single farm makes a different cheese. I like to compare it to baking a cake. You know, if you go home and you make a cake, if I give somebody next door to you the exact same cake recipe, the exact same equipment, the exact same time, they'll make a completely different cake. And that's what you get with farmhouse cheese. But when there was 2,000 farmhouse cheese, Wednesdale cheesemakers, each one of them was making a slightly different version of Wednesdale. And some would have preferred some and some would have preferred others. And the differences weren't just by the by them being next door to each other, they were amplified because they have different breeds of cows, they have different pasture, they did have different equipment. Like you might have different cake pans and different ovens, they have slightly different equipment to make their cheese. And all that means those little nuances, even though they were all making Wednesdale, they all turned out slightly different. And what we've seen as part of the British cheese resurgence is an example of that. Four years ago when I set up here, there wasn't a cheesemaker maker on the farm within 20 miles. There's now four. And we're going to look at two of these now. We're going to look at Old Moan. So up until about nine months ago, they weren't making cheese. Their cheese went to Wednesdale Creamery. Uh, their milk went to Wednesdale Creamery, and it was used to make factory at Wednesdale up there, which is a fabulous little cheese. But about nine months ago, they got a leader grant from the EU and decided to make their own little cheese. And they made a Wednesday recipe, a Wednesday recipe that's actually exactly the same as the one beneath it, the Felstone. And this is one of the great things. So they made a Wednesday recipe and used their own milk. And I'm going to put cheese iron in it now and get a little sample for you, just have a little taste. So what they have done is they're making on their farm with their own milk, Sam and Ben Spence and their brother Adam. And they're making a really classic Wednesday. So it's really quite bright white, it's quite crumbly, quite fresh, quite clean in flavour. And just nice moisture to it. And yeah, so they've just restarted making Wednesday the way it was made. And it's a fabulous cheese. But interestingly, just next door to them, you have about 15 miles away, Felstone, who've been making about four years. And they're making again a traditional Wednesday recipe, cloth bounds made by Tom and Claire Noblet on their family farm. And even though they're following exactly the same recipe, you get two very different cheeses. So their Felstone is moister, it's a bit more yellow and richer, a bit more rounded in flavour. This cheese is barely two weeks old, it's a traditional Dale's cheese. When we graded it, we can put the iron back in and just seal it back up, and that allows the cheese to continue to mature. It just gives it a real nice rounded, rich flavour. And that's one of the things I love about farmhouse cheese is that you've got two farms that are right very very close to each other, very very close to each other, but they're making exactly the same recipe. We get two different cheeses, and we stock them both. And we stock a third one called Stonebeck, again made to the same recipe, and they all taste completely different. And that's one of the exciting things. So they've been part of the farmhouse cheese resurgence. Now I'm not going to give you too much of a history in the farm farmhouse cheese in the history of the politics and go into all of that. But once upon a time, every farm made cheese because it had to. It had to make cheese because if you didn't preserve your milk, it went off. 
and especially in rural areas like the Dales and down in Somerset, we made hard cheeses that could be transported a long time and see us through the winter. And all those farms were making cheese and the whole cheese industry collapsed. Lots of reasons. You can look at industrialization, you can look at a mass market of milk, you can look at the milk marketing board and a lot of people blame it on wartime rationing, but the problems were well before that. Um, in the 1800s, we were importing 80% of our cheese. You know, we, were, we became a milk drinking nation. But there's no doubt by the end of the Second World War, British farmhouse cheese was in dire straits. You know, in Wensdale, I know the figures because we're very close to it. Pre-war, 145 producers. After the war, down to 67. By 1957, the last one gave up forever. And there wasn't a farmhouse cheese producer in the whole of the Dales. That's 685 square miles for around about 60 years. Wensdale Creamery did a fabulous job up at the creamery, making uh, factory-made Wensdale, which is a great, nice crisp product, but not these individual characterful Wensdales made on the farm. And so after the war, Britain was going through dire straits, and there was some farmhouse cheesemakers left. There was some that had been handed it down, legacy after legacy, the likes of the Kirkhams and the Keynes, who did it because their mother did it, and still doing it to this day, not because of a foodie trend or because they're interested in food, but because their farmers always made cheese. And there's one man, and maybe two, if you include James Aldridge, who helped keep British cheese alive. And Patrick Ranson, his book is fabulous, worth purchasing. Look um, at that monocle, Andy. Yeah, look at the monocle. So cool. <laughs> um, this is from the 80s, his book. It's well out of date. It's it's not up to date. I make all my stuff, read it as homework when they start working with the courtyard there. It's, it's part of what you have to do if you work here is you get homework. Uh, and he had a little cheese shop and he helped champion those farmhouse cheese makers who were still making and continuing them. But even then, there wasn't much of a demand, demand for cheeses like this. However, things started to change in about the 70s. We started to get a bit of a resurgence. Um, what we started to see was things start to change and, and develop. And that really went in two strands. You started to see people who were kept alive by Patrick Rance. We also started to see people do things that were new and interesting. And the one we're going to taste first is an example of that. That's this Lanark Blue. So this is the one we talked about at the beginning. The first of a cheesemaker I visited. And this is made by a guy called Humphrey Errington. Well, was at the time. And Humphrey uses sheep's milk. He decided he looked at the way cheese was being made traditionally in the north of England and Scotland, and they were made with sheep's milk. And sheep's milk produces this natural gas called lock and stock, which gives it an open texture, which then allows the blue mould to spread easier. And that's why a lot of the classic blue cheeses were originally sheep's milk, and some still are. What for? Picos, even traditional Wednesday. And he wanted to capture that, so he got milk sheep and started making them. Um, a rock for style, so to speak, but within Scotland, so a throwback to how Scottish cheeses perhaps were. And in the 70s, if you went and bought blue cheese, you'd have got Danish blue, Gorgonzola, Stilton, or rock for. And nowadays, if you go to a deli or a farm shop or even a supermarket and you look at the blue cheeses, there's a massive range of British blue cheeses. Like larger scale ones, like Black Sticks and Shepherd's Purse ones, but also small artisan ones. But when Humphrey set out, there was nobody. Really, and he was really part of a pioneer, really a trendsetter in making different blue cheeses in Britain. But that modern British cheese revival started to gain pace a little bit throughout the 90s. Um, now, there's lots of people who would argue there's lots of reasons for it. Now, one of the reasons perhaps is somebody like Keith Floyd got on TV, started promoting British food, the campaign for real ale, borough market, farmers markets, all started to gather a good food guide and more good restaurants. But what was a key factor is, is alongside that, you had other people promoting it within the industry, the likes of Niels Dairy and James Aldridge and Patrick Rance were promoting it and Juliet Harbert. But alongside all of that, there still wasn't that much good British cheese being made. And that restaurant that I was working in, as little as 15 years ago, it was all mainly French. The second strand of the British farm cheese arrival was economics. So it really came down to it. Farmers don't want to make cheese unless they have to, because it's a real pain. It's a real extra laborious thing on the day. They have to milk their animals, look after them still. But to make a cheese is all the effort of making it, then maturing it, then looking after it and selling it. The reason a lot of these farms turned back to it is in the early 90s, the milk marketing board collapsed and the price of milk plummeted. And that meant a lot of farms went out of business. They stopped dairying, they diversified. A lot of farms became larger. Now the difficulties with dairying and larging, particularly where we are in the Dales here, is the fields are small and challenging. So you can only milk off one milking power about 60 cows. And so that means you can't just buy more land and get bigger because the cows have got to walk to and from the milking power. More land means you'd have to almost cut food and bring it to them, which would become a more industrial kind of larger scale production, which is actually quite difficult to do on, in a dairy farm if you want to keep it traditional. So a lot of these small farmers can't make 
money economically from milk. So they diversified. Both of these are classic examples of a farm that's diversified into making cheese because of a low price of milk. And that was really the catalyst. So alongside the good food and the people supporting them, the catalyst was actually if farmers could make cheese, they could add value to their milk on the farm and keep their farm going. The advantages of being a small farm is you're in control of the land and the animals, which means that you can make a product completely of your farm, which means that you can also potentially use raw milk and maximize that flavor. So that resurgence started to take place about in the early noughties really and it's taken more and more uh, momentum to where we are today. And a lot of new cheesemakers have sprung up and we've seen those new cheesemakers go down two real routes. You've seen people recreate traditional cheese and that's what we've got here. Um, so you see it with people like Spark and Red Leicester who's recreated Red Leicester. You see it with Stitcherton who's recreated um, Stilton and the Gore with Caffilly guys. And this is Young Buck, so this is a classic Stilton-esque recipe. But it's not made in the Stilton region, it's made with raw milk. Uh, but Mike studied cheese making in the Stilton region and then made Red Leicester for many years at Spike and Farm. But went back to Northern Ireland and decided to make Stilton the way it used to be made. Um, which is moister, it's less aggressively blue, it's matured slower. And that means you get a more complex flavour. It means you get this real yeasty rind which gives it a different flavour to the rind. Where the blue's broken it down you get smooth, smooth sweet creaminess. And the little patches without blue give it a real freshness. Uh, so Mike is really making Stilton perhaps the way it was 100 years ago. Um, but there's no real Stilton makers making traditional, making modern Stilton who are quite like it, it was. We've got a couple of other producers who are in the region, Spark and Old Blue and Stitcherton, who again make raw milk exactly the same recipe as Mike. What's really fascinating is we stock all three cheeses and they all taste distinctly different. So you saw people recreate traditions. You saw have a cheddar farm really sustainably and make a really slow cheddar make the way it used to be done and have created a completely different cheddar to what you'd expect. And you also saw people create completely new cheeses. And so you've got the likes of Baron Bygod, who took a brewing recipe from France and altered it to their land and their, their equipment and also their cows. And it's not about taking French cheeses and copying them because we'll never do it as good as those farms that have got legacy, that have handed down their recipes mother to daughter. What we can do is take influences and apply them to the British landscape and the British, British um, breeding of cows and the British equipment we have over here and make a cheese that takes those influences. And you've got that here with a Marlon Tom. So this is a Yorkshire cheese. It's made by a guy called Alistair Pearson and he makes it with raw milk. It's quite a farmy, quite intense cheese. And he makes a German Tom style. He, his wife's German. He's from Yorkshire, but he moved abroad to Germany to be a farmer over there with his wife for many years. Um, his cheese maker left and so he ended up making cheese and they taught him how to make a German Tom style. And when he turned to Yorkshire 10 years ago, he took up that and he's making it this day. And so what you've seen is the two strands, people making these traditional cheeses, as well as people making modern, modern examples as well. And that's where the British cheese industry has gone at this moment. So we have seen this massive resurgence and a, and a, and a massive range and increase of, of traditional farm cheeses. And we're proud to be part of that and have been part of that. And I've hopefully encouraged farmers to set up. Um, but it is a very fragile industry. And it is a very fragile industry that's worth supporting. Pre-war, there was 145 farmhouse Wednesday Dale producers. Now there's three. They need your support. Without it, they won't exist. And I think farmhouse cheese is worth supporting for lots of reasons. A, it's part of our social history and culture. B, once this knowledge is lost, it's hard to rebuild. Graham Kirkham is a fabulous Lancashire cheesemaker. One of the reasons he's one of the best is he learnt off his mum. And he felt that curve. And he altered, and he, he's done it with, alongside his mum for a long time. And she did it with her mum before that. And that knowledge passed down is very easy to, to, to gain and to, to, to learn and to experience. However, if you lose that knowledge, if a, for a long period a lot of these cheeses weren't produced, Wednesday wasn't produced for about 60 years on the farm, rebuilding it is very difficult. You can look at pictures, you can read it in books, you can um, speak to people who've stopped, the older generations, but you can't really capture it if, unless you're doing it alongside somebody. And we saw the dairy schools close and us lose a lot of knowledge. We're trying to rebuild it. But if we don't hold on to it, we'll lose that knowledge again. And it's impossible to build it exactly the same way it was. See, it keeps money in rural areas and keeps small farms viable and secure. And I think that's really important. It keeps jobs in rural areas because we have the value here. And D, it's really tasty. You know, it's really important because it's really tasty. And finally, if you're adding value on the farm, you can farm more ethically and sustainably because it's not about the lowest price of milk. It's actually about creating a product which tastes really good. And that includes more ethical, sustainable farming practices and heritage breeds. So I think farmhouse cheese is worth supporting this cheese revival as part of this. And this is what British Weekender is about. It's about supporting this cheese revival. Because if we don't, it will go 
we will lose it. You know, and it's not just about buying cheese from me at the Courtyard Dairy, it's about buying cheese from your local retailer, from somebody who ever supports Farmhouse Cheese. Diversity is key, not just in cheese retailers, in cheese producers. I want four Farmhouse Wednesday producers. In fact, I want a dozen, you know, because they'll all be different and they'll all be made locally and they'll all be, people will prefer different ones. And the only way we can do that is if you buy and eat cheese. It's not too hard to do, but that's my key message is buy and support traditional Farmhouse Cheese from your local retailer wherever you can. Thanks for listening and carry on supporting British Cheese Weekender. Jenny Linford's up next and she's doing a fabulous thing about some endangered cheeses and how to keep them alive. Cheers.